Lord, thank you that our circumstances don't dictate your sovereignty. Your sovereignty is so much more powerful than the things that we're walking through, and sometimes our flesh fails to realize that truth. But, Lord, would we cling to that so tightly? Lord, I just find ask today that we find a place to posture ourselves before you to trust you. It's something we say that we do, but, Lord, would you... Open our eyes to actually seek you enough to trust you with everything we walk through. In Jesus' name, amen. Just kidding. There it is. There we are. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. This is different for me. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Chelsea Smith, and to connect the dot for some people, my dad is Pastor Allen. Um, it's so fun when people are like, what? <laughs> and it's because I've grown up here, so I'm like, oh, well, sometimes I forget there are new faces that don't know that, so there's a connect point. Um, but most times I am with the youth group, so this is very different for me to be speaking to adults. <laughs> Hopefully I don't have to shush everybody the whole time myself to get off their phones. Um, but uh, like I was saying when picking that song, um, there have been a lot of circumstances that have taken place over the last couple months that, man, when you ask the Lord to show you things, he does it in some fun ways. Um, but also, Pastor Justin was sharing during his message a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about how um, he was about to walk on stage, and he was, like, so nervous. And Tammy Sweeney, for those of you who know her, looked at him and was like, I hope you never lose that, and he was making a joke about it. And I call that the Holy Spirit heart attack. So um, I'm already there. <laughs> uh, so this morning, we're going to be reading out of John chapter 4, verses 43. 46 through 54, and um, when studying for this, I came across so many videos and commentaries and all the things, and I found a video that, because I'm a visual learner, it helped me kind of visualize what was actually going on. So I have a video we're going to play. Um, it's 100% an off version or off-brand version of The Chosen, so it's cheesy, but it helps you um, connect throughout the story, at least it did for me, so... Bear with us. See how his love and you can also follow, follow along because it's pretty accurate word for word to what the scripture says. So. And then we'll read the scripture. <laughs> After spending two days there, Jesus left and went to Galilee. For he himself had said, Prophets are not respected in their own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the people there welcomed him, because they had gone to the Passover festival in Jerusalem and had seen everything that he had done during the festival. Then Jesus went back to Cana in Galilee where he had turned the water into wine. A government official was there whose son was sick in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to go to Capernaum and heal his son who was about to die. None of you will ever believe unless you see miracles and wonders 
Sir, come with me. Before my child dies. Go. Your son will live. The man believed Jesus' words and went. <laughs> On his way home, his servants met him with the news. Boy, he's going to live. He asked them what time it was when his son got better. It was one o'clock yesterday afternoon when the fever left him. Then the father remembered that it was at that very hour when Jesus had told him. Your son will live. So he and all his family believe. This was the second miracle that Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. Um, I love when you read because it brings things to life, so would you mind reading what we just watched? In John chapter 4, verses 43 through 54. Yeah. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, where he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed, and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Something that I immediately noticed when reading this was in verse 58, it says, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. And it convicted me very quickly <laughs> that there have been so many times that I know the Lord has spoken to me but for some reason, my flesh allows the doubt to creep in and test the character of the Lord that I know that he's proven himself over and over and over again. Um, the second thing I noticed is this is the, the last time he was in Cana, Jesus had performed one of his greatest miracles, um, which was verse 46. It says, once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a satirian royal a certain royal official whose son lay sick in Capernaum. And then we go back to John chapter 2, verse 11. And it says, What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. And it's also cool because that was the first miracle that he um, performed. Um, there was a heart of urgency in the official when asking for Jesus to heal his son. And to me, I feel like that means, you know, he had to posture, in the video, we don't know that that actually happened the way that it did, but I do find it funny that he gets off of his horse. And when I watched that, I was like, oh my gosh, we do have to come off of a high horse sometimes <laughs> and um, find a posture of humility to allow ourselves to realize we're not capable of doing everything. Um, and when I read this, I, man, 
When the royal official approached Jesus with his needs, to me that means that he had to put his pride aside and admit that he was not able to accomplish the task, accomplish the task at hand. This passage simply reminded me that there is nothing that can get in the way of God, which should bring our hearts peace, but because our flesh fails to trust this truth, even God has proved himself time and time again, which leads me to our next point on the page. We, al- we allow our flesh to be blinded by the sovereignty of the Lord, and when the outcome of a situation that we're walking through doesn't go as expected, I tend to struggle, and I'm sure that I'm not the only one, with the fact that this doesn't change the character of God. I also believe we weren't created to understand the why behind everything, and if we were created to understand the why behind everything, why would we need to rely on the Lord? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, if someone wants to read that. Do we have anybody? Anybody? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Um, a few years ago, I believe it was 2019, I feel like my brain is just like all over the place when looking back. I went on a year-long mission trip and I say my brain's fogged because it was the time of COVID and all the things and being back home, like, anyway. Um, there was a situation that occurred the very first week of my trip. (laughs) Um, I had, looking back, I feel like I wanted to do this trip so, so bad because I knew there were people who hadn't heard of the Lord, and that was my intention on doing it. And when I had approached my mom and dad, I had, like, already made the decision. I'm like, I'm going on this. You guys can't tell me any different. (laughs) Instead of going, hey, mom and dad, can you pray with me that I'm supposed to do this trip? Um, and you know, the Lord still uses those things. And I am willing to admit that maybe I didn't hear from the Lord, you're supposed to go on this trip, but it was something that I was like, I want to do this. Um, and with that being said, the enemy immediately started attacking me. So for the first six days, we were traveling so many hours and, um, we arrived in Costa Rica in Los Chiles, in the middle of absolutely nowhere, on a farm. And um, it's about a three and a half hour drive down the mountain to like the main city. And we got there, and like I said, it was a week into the trip. And funny enough, we left on the 12th, we arrived on my birthday. <laughs> so I'm dealing with this on my birthday, of all things. And um, I started realizing that I was in a lot of pain. I had been in pain, but I am very stubborn, and I will just deal with it (laughs) instead of asking for help. And I got to the point where I was, I felt like I was dying. I was in so much pain. And I couldn't walk. Everything was hurting. And um, we come to find out we had a situation with one of our leaders that he was like, Chelsea, you have to go to the hospital. Something, something's wrong. And so when they approached me with this, I'm like, I'm in a foreign country. I don't want to go to the hospital. I was very scared. And again, one week into the trip, and I'm like, but what happens if they tell me I have to go home? I'm not going to be able to complete the year trip. And so all of these things I'm battling in my head, and they finally convinced me that I need to go to the hospital. And so We make the trip down the mountain. It costs so much money just to have someone come pick us up and take us. On top of that, if you've ever been on a trip um, and serving in this capacity, there's no AC. The windows, funny enough, are busted out. So we're driving down a dirty, uh, a dirt road mountain, and there's dust coming into the van. It's hot. It's the rainy season, so it's pouring down rain one minute. It's just a hot mess. And I'm sitting in the back of this van in so much pain. And I'm like, God, why? And here I am like, he said I was supposed to go on this trip. (laughs) And I think this was his way of being like, you know, you're supposed to listen for my voice. Yes, it's something you wanted to do, but just wait until I call you. So we get down to the hospital and come to find out I had a cyst that had ruptured. And um, they were telling me I needed to have surgery like then. And I was like, that is not going to happen. I don't know about that. 
So the option was you have surgery here in Central America or you fly home, so you're gonna spend more money on a ticket and all the things and hospitals here are not cheap either. <laughs> and I immediately am just like doubting everything. And I'm so thankful for the team. So it was about 40-ish people who went on this trip and we all split up into groups of six or seven. So my team, there were seven of us and they were praying so hard. And I'm just so thankful because in that moment, there was so much doubt that God could intervene. And looking back, I'm like, what were you thinking? Like, you've been raised in a church. You've had the opportunity to see God move so many times. And he has so many times. What's different about this situation? And I'm just so grateful that they just kept praying. And um, we get to the hospital, and the doctor looks at me and was like, uh, we, we can't take you in. I'm so sorry. We're going home. And so I look at my leader like, what do we do now? We just drove like three and a half hours to the hospital. And the Lord provided. He was a squad leader. So we had different leaders who had been on the trip before. And then they can go on the next year's trip to kind of like lead the group. Um, so he had squad led the year previous. And there was a girl who, funny enough, was from Costa Rica. And he calls her and she's like, oh my goodness, you can just come stay at our house until we can get things taken care of. So that's one less thing we had to worry about financially. Um, and they just took such good care of us, fed us, and loved on us. We got to worship together, and those memories are definitely special. Um, but we sat down, and we prayed, and prayed, and prayed. And I mean, we I was at the point where I'm like, I don't know what else to do, and other than go home. I already was like, fine, I'll just throw in the towel, and I'll just go home. This is God telling me to go home. Um, that's not what he was telling me to do. He was telling me to listen for his voice and trust him. And I asked them that night, I was like, okay, let's just start looking at hospitals tomorrow and see what's open. So we go back to the same hospital and the same doctor looked at me and said, we have an opening and we're going to go ahead and take you in. And so after getting everything checked out, um, they were wanting to do immediate surgery. And they're telling me that this is the only way that this is going to be cured. And we call our team and we're like, I am absolutely terrified of having surgery due to, I think it was 2017 that I had emergency gallbladder surgery. It was very traumatic. That surgery is usually supposed to be an in and out patient kind of surgery and I was there for four days. Um, so the thought of having surgery already was like, God, I don't know, I don't know that I can trust you with this. But he was reminding me, you're still alive. You came through the surgery. Just trust me. And that's all he kept speaking. And so I go in for a pre-op the next day, and the doctor looks at me and was like, you don't need surgery. Who told you you need surgery? And I was like, the, the doctor <laughs> before you. And he was looking at all of the x-rays and everything and all the pictures that they sent over to him. And he was like, I don't understand because right here, from what I just got, not even 24 hours ago, is saying that you need surgery, but I, I can't find anything. And I'm sitting here like, no, it's there. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? The pictures say it. He's like, no, it's not. I don't know what you're talking about. And so, again, in that moment, just letting it pass by that I wasn't like, did the Lord heal me? Like, it... And it disappointed me later on to look back at that moment and realize I didn't catch it. Um, so we get back and um, come to find out my team had been praying. They spent all night long praying. While I was at the hospital, I had contacted my parents. They had posted it all over Facebook. There were hundreds of people covering me in prayer. And I failed to realize that's a miracle. <laughs> what was there physically was completely gone. And I have not had any issues with that ever since. Like, it just baffles my mind and I was able to complete the entire trip. And I have to remind myself, we serve a God who doesn't allow distance or human constraints to get in the way of his will. If his will is for someone to be healed, he's going to do it. If his will is for someone to receive financial provision, he's going to make a way to do that. Um, we just have to allow our flesh to get out of the way. We may be finite beings with definite limitations, but that does not mean God shares in our limitations. 
when I read this story, I think about all of the people within the household. What were they feeling when they heard that the official had ran into Jesus? I wonder, like, maybe there were some people who were questioning their faith, or maybe they didn't believe at all, and they're like, there's no way, and they just believe that it was a coincidence, or, you know, he wasn't here, so how did he do that? And I'm sure they also were aware that he had performed a miracle already with turning water into the wine at the wedding, that maybe something was stirring in their head of like, well, I heard this from so-and-so, that Jesus did this, and so there's a lot of questioning, but they're still open to knowing if that's who Jesus says he is. Just because the Lord doesn't always reveal himself physically does not limit his capabilities. Someone could read Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus. And I know this scripture isn't necessarily talking about healing, but it does encourage us that he is not a God who will just give up in the middle of our process, that he's going to bring his work to completion. While I was reading this story and doing studying on it, I was reminded just like the official begging Jesus to come to his son, he forgot that Jesus wasn't limited in his infinite power and distance. And sometimes I find myself in the same place as the official begging and pleading for X, Y, and Z, And I get lost in the lie that God's not capable of meeting my need. When I was praying about when we first received our assignment for this, I was like, Lord, why would, what am I supposed to speak on? (laughs) Like, how, how do you bring something out? And like I said, this is the first time I've been with adults. So God was like, you've, you've done this with the kids and it's no different. Um, And he was just reminding me that there's been so many times that I have asked the Lord for something, and I'm sure you guys can relate that you've asked and asked and asked, maybe for the same thing, and you're just like, why is it not happening? And you get discouraged, and we allow our flesh to dictate the character of God. In verses 47 through 49, let's see. When this man had heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. I'm not a parent, but I can only imagine, and especially after this last month, being a parent and having a child who's close to death. As many of you know, um, there's an Egyptian family that attends our church. And when preparing for this message, I just kept asking the Lord, like, help me relate to this passage. And the situation that took place is not what I was expecting him to help me understand. Their little girl would have been two this coming January. And the Lord called her home a week ago today. Did not think that I was going to talk about this. (laughs) And like I said, I'm not a parent. But walking into a hospital room and witnessing a mom and a father weep like I have never heard 
help me understand that this man was desperate for the Lord to intervene. Being persistent and bringing your requests to the Father. If someone could read Philippians 4, 6, and then if I could have someone ready to read 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 7. And then first Peter chapter five verses six through seven. This says nothing about being persistent in presenting your request, but it does say that he cares. So if it takes persistence, his character is that he cares. When we align our hearts with the Father and allow his desires to become our own, he will move. When you find yourself in a posture to trust, the Lord always comes through. I believe this also goes with aligning our hearts and our spirits. The official had been brought to a place that we all need to find ourselves in at times when learning how to trust the Lord. And sometimes I think he allows us to be in such a desperate place. Not like he's like putting his thumb on you to be like, trust me. (laughs) But he allows certain situations for us to walk through so that we learn to trust him. And if it takes us having to do it multiple times, he's going to allow it because his heart is that he cares. When we posture ourselves to trust, we posture ourselves to receive. In verse 53, it says the whole household was delivered salvation. So not only did Jesus physically grant healing, he also delivered salvation. So not only did he perform a miracle of healing someone from a distance, he also used that to allow these people to realize who he is and who he says he is to be true. Many of them could have brushed it off or even been fed the lie that it was a coincidence. But so many times we rob ourselves from encountering the Lord because we allow doubt, fear, or unbelief to creep in. To that, I have to remind myself we're not capable of quenching the sovereignty of the Lord. And lastly, His sovereignty does not submit to our circumstances. Our circumstances submit to His sovereignty. And I think about reading this story, and had he not healed the son, I'm sure there were people in the household that probably wouldn't take him for who he was at his word if the outcome was that the child didn't survive. But that doesn't make God's sovereignty any less than. And when reading this, I see, yes, he was a royal official, but he was also a father. Um and walking through this past week, there's so many times that our flesh allows us to see people in the titles that they are instead of who God's called them to be. God called this man to be a father. And so, again, walking with this family this past week, it just made him human to me. Um, can't go there because I'm going to cry again. (laughs) The scripture we read earlier said to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. And funny enough, um, years and years ago, Pastor Wayne, when did you write that song? Yeah, that's pretty, pretty close to when I got this Bible and I have it 
written right next to it, Pastor Wade's song. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask Pastor Will to come. But when, when this past week took place, and then reading this scripture and kind of being able to relate the two, I have not been able to get that scripture out of my heart. And funny enough, I had asked Pastor Will to do that before this situation occurred. And I just think it's so important to note in this passage that he had, the father had to humble himself and realize that he was not capable of stepping in and intervening. And so I've asked Pastor Will to sing one of Pastor Wayne's songs um, called The Broken Ones. And I think in the next however many minutes we need, we are broken. You are not capable of fixing everything. If you were, again, you wouldn't have to rely on the Lord to intervene. And so I just wanted to give us some time this morning to humble ourselves before the Lord and realize that his hand is mighty. It doesn't say that ours is. It says that under God's mighty hand. And one of the lines in this song, every time we've done it, um, even as a little girl listening to this song, there's a part that says, if we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, he will lift us up and steady us to stand. And that is a truth that I have stood on for apparently a decade. (laughs) Um, There have been, in this situation specifically, that line came up and it comes up frequently. And so I just want to encourage you this morning to take a place of humility before the Lord. Because I'm telling you the moment that you do, (laughs) you'll see his mighty hand.